Denver, November 1st, 1955. Precisely 6.11 in the evening. United Airlines Flight 629 has just landed at Denver's Stapleton Airport. The Douglas DC-6 is in the middle of a cross-country flight between New York and Seattle. The flight's next stop was Portland, Oregon. Whilst in Denver, the plane was refueled. New passengers got on, and their bags were stored in the plane's cargo compartment. In all, 39 passengers were on board the plane. Plus the flight crew and flight attendants, there were 44 people on the flight. Some of the stories of those who boarded United 629 included that of a young off-duty flight attendant by the name of Sally Schofield. Aged just 24, she was traveling to Seattle to make preparations for her upcoming wedding. Whilst at the airport in Denver, she bumped into her friend Gloria, who she said goodbye to. The youngest passenger on board was a 13-month-old infant, traveling to Japan to visit their father who worked in the Navy. Up on the flight deck, there were three pilots. In command was a veteran of World War II, 39-year-old Captain Lee Hall. After 10,000 flight hours logged, Captain Hall was about to give up his flying career and settle into a new life running a local shop to spend more time with his family. First Officer Donald White was the youngest member of the crew, aged just 26. He joined United Airlines four years previously and had now settled in to his piloting career. 38-year-old flight engineer Samuel Arthur was not supposed to be on this flight. He was called in as a substitute member of flight crew as United Airlines flight engineers were out on strike that day. Their Douglas DC-6 prop liner was loaded up as normal and the pilots called for startup. After spending around half an hour on the ground, United Airlines Flight 629 was in position on the runaway, departing to the east. At 6.52, the plane was airborne. Captain Lee Hall was at the flight controls for this leg. Captain Hall took the DC-6 into a left-hand turn to take them in a northwesterly heading. Flight 629 would fly out over the rural areas north of Denver. Soon, they'd fly over the Rocky Mountains. The departure from Denver calls for the pilots to check in with a scheduled routine radio call to note passing a waypoint. At 6.56, the pilots made that expected call. A further radio call was expected to be made when the plane reached 18,000 feet. Sadly, they would never get to that point. That last radio communication would be the final time anyone heard from the plane. In the next moments, disaster would strike. Down below, Flight 629 was about to pass over the small rural town of Longmont, about 30 miles north of Denver. Back in the Denver airport control tower, controllers would likely have not been able to see the plane in the overcast evening sky. What they did see, however, at 7.03 in the evening, were bright lights that lit up the Colorado skies that were seen descending toward the ground. Two of them, in fact, one noticeably brighter in appearance than the other. For 45 seconds, the bright streaks of light were seen descending into the Colorado countryside. Flashes were even observed from the airport tower. Immediately, controllers began accounting for all aircraft in the area. The only plane that failed to respond to radio calls was United Airlines Flight 629. The plane was lost. Soon thereafter, the news started to come through that nearby residents had heard explosions and reports of fiery debris falling from the sky painted a sinister picture. Large segments of wreckage from Flight 629 crashed into farmland. The middle section of the DC-6, that being the mid-fuselage, much of the wings, landing gear and engines, were found in two separate craters engulfed in flames that burned for three days straight despite efforts to extinguish the blades. Airplane parts, luggage, passenger seating and human remains were spread over an area spanning six square miles. It was clear that all 44 people on board the plane were dead. Investigators now had the task of figuring out how this plane crashed. From the start, the pattern of wreckage being strewn over such a large area clearly indicated that an in-flight breakup had occurred and this was one of the first things to be established. However, some wreckage disappeared, 
as some took the opportunity to loot the area, taking part of the airplane and passenger belongings. The crash site needed to be guarded. How the plane broke apart was, at that point, not understood. This didn't stop the media from speculating with their own theories. The fact that a plane crashed like this became headline news across the country. Flying was comparatively unsafe when compared to today, and there was an increased fear of flying. Early speculative reports suggested mechanical failure. Instead, the cause of this disaster would be about as far from that as you could imagine. As investigators began combing through the wreckage and making notes of what they found, a very dark picture began to emerge, and little did investigators know at the time, but this disaster was about to become a pivotal moment in aviation history. United Flight 629 was about to attract the attention of more than just air crash investigators. Though the tail structure of the plane was found largely intact, the aft fuselage was blown apart. A countless number of smaller pieces of wreckage were attributed to the rear end of the plane. This was in contrast to other parts of the plane that crashed into the ground in larger chunks. It appeared that the skin of the aft fuselage shattered. Further analysis of the wreckage would appear to suggest that the skin was blown outward from inside the plane. And that was the next piece of the puzzle, the reason why the plane broke apart in flight. An explosion had occurred on board. Wreckage of the plane was taken to a warehouse in Denver, where the plane was to be reassembled in a mock-up to give investigators a better picture of where this explosion might have come from specifically. The more pieces of the plane they could find, the better accurate an image investigators would have. By carefully plotting out where each piece came from, a pattern emerged that pinpointed pretty much exactly where this explosion came from. Following the smaller and smaller fragments to the center of the source, almost like tracing to the center of a spider's web, it was determined that the explosion that brought Flight 629 down originated in cargo compartment number 4, located in the aft fuselage below the passenger cabin. All records indicated the plane was well maintained, there was no evidence of structural failure, at least not before the explosion anyway, and mechanical failure was ruled out. So something in the cargo exploded, and well, all evidence was pointing towards a bomb. Conclusively so when explosive material was found on fragments of the wreckage. By this point, the FBI was involved. The crash site of United 629 was no longer just the impact site of a plane crash. It was a crime scene. But how could a bomb get on board? Cargo compartment number four contained mail, freight cargo, and passenger luggage. This compartment, you can imagine, was almost like an overflow compartment, as only a few bags were actually loaded here, belonging to passengers who boarded the plane in Denver. Investigators were even able to trace exactly where in the compartment the blast came from, which bag contained the bomb, and who that bag belonged to. The one red tartan pattern bag in the compartment that was completely destroyed, whereas the other bags were found in relatively recognizable condition. The name of the individual attached to the bomb was 53-year-old Daisy Eldera King. And it is at this point that we must start unraveling the other side of this story. So, who was Daisy Eldera King? Mrs. Daisy King died as one of the passengers on United Flight 629. She was not the culprit. But we need to know a bit more about this woman and her story to understand where the bomb came from, who planted it, and how it ended up in her bag. A one Daisy Walker was born in 1902, and for most of her life, she lived as a poor woman. She married a man by the name of Tom Gallagher, who she had her first child with, Helen, who was born in 1923. The two divorced, and Daisy remarried to a man named William Graham who she had her second child with, John, 
who was born in 1932. John was given the nickname Jack, and will now be referred to as Jack for the rest of this video. William Graham, Jack's father, died in 1935 from pneumonia when he was just three years old. Daisy spent a lot of her time working, and was largely out of Jack's early life, so he was largely raised by other family members, namely his grandmother who also passed away. Subsequently, due to this passing and the Great Depression of the 1930s, this meant that his mother Daisy, who was already a poor woman, could not afford to raise another child. She sent Jack to an orphanage during the Great Depression, and then went on with her life. As the years went on, the two became more distant. In 1941, Daisy married again, this time to a one, Earl King, who passed away shortly after marriage. She would retain the name King until her own untimely death in 1955 on board the United Airlines plane. Following the death of her third husband, she inherited a certain level of wealth. She then invested that wealth and opened up multiple restaurants in Denver. She found success as a businesswoman. Though she was now wealthy, it would take several years for her to be reconnected with her long estranged son, but still retained contact with her daughter Helen. In fact, Daisy King was flying on United 629 to visit Helen for the holiday season who moved to Alaska. This was how Daisy King's situation remained for many years. We must now skip ahead to 1954. Now a 22-year-old married man and father of two himself, Jack Gilbert Graham married a woman named Gloria. He reconnected with his mother Daisy in 1954. According to sources, it may seem that the two initially got on well. Daisy employed her long-lost son as manager of her restaurant, and she even lived with him for a time. Although, according to those who knew the two, their relationship was a bit contentious. They didn't really get along in the end, and arguments were reported to have been common, especially if it involved the family business. It is believed that Jack Graham deeply despised his own mother. Some sources refer to this as a grudge he held against her, for effectively abandoning him when he was young. This was something he continued to deny until his own death. During that time apart, as he grew older, Graham developed violent tendencies, which were later explained to investigators by those who knew him, including his own spouse, Gloria. Mr. Jack Graham was even suspected of sabotaging his mother's business. In 1955, shortly before the United Airlines disaster, he took out an insurance policy on the business, which was significantly damaged in a gas explosion shortly thereafter. Graham had received an insurance payout from this incident. If there is one thing that we need to make clear about Daisy King, it's that she was perhaps already familiar with Jack's own past before their reunion. Among the items that Daisy is believed to have kept with her on herself in carry-on luggage on United 629 included clippings of newspaper articles relating to Jack Graham's own past, detailing his run-ins with the law, and previous prison time he spent in Texas. His criminal record detailed that in 1951, he was arrested for embezzlement of his employer by committing check forgery. He worked on payroll at this company where he forged his boss's signature to steal from his employer. He was also accused of transporting alcohol illegally. It can't really be overstated just what a piece of work Jack Gilbert Graham actually was. In 1955, upon hearing that Daisy was traveling to Alaska to visit his half-sister Helen, he came up with the plan of killing his own mother. And here is how it went down. On October 26th, six days before the disaster, he traveled out of town to acquire nitroglycerin dynamite from a rural store. He constructed an explosive device using a total of 25 sticks of the explosive connected to a simple timer and battery. He would, at a later stage, time the bomb to go off at around 7 p.m. on November 1st, 1955. The bomb was concealed and disguised as a Christmas present that his mother was to take with her to Alaska. He would later try to claim that the gift was some kind of tool set. On the day of November 1st, Graham would sleep in following a night shift at his mechanic job the night before. He wouldn't wake until the afternoon. Daisy saw it was necessary that day to make plans to store her car as she would be gone for significant time. Our bomber suggested leaving her suitcase with him as it would be loaded into his car to be taken to the airport. 
This was how he obtained Daisy's luggage to plant the bomb. At this moment, the bomb was not yet primed. That would come later. He removed some of Daisy's belongings from the suitcase and placed the gift containing dynamite inside. Later that afternoon, he arrived at Stapleton Airport to meet his mother and his wife Gloria, who was also at the airport, not before quietly priming the bomb by reaching into the suitcase. The reason this was done at this point and not before was because the timer he used was a simple 60 minute countdown timer. From here, he timed the bomb to go off 60 minutes from then, which would make it roughly 7 p.m. None the wiser to its actual contents, Daisy Eldora King then went to check the bag in for United Airlines Flight 629 to Seattle via Portland, where the bag would then be loaded into compartment number four on the DC-6. So what actually was the motive for doing this, aside from just killing his own mother? Jack Graham was largely motivated by greed, and he was about to attempt to commit insurance fraud. But he had also learned that he stood to benefit from significant inheritance following Daisy's passing. We have to understand that flying by plane in the 1950s, despite how glamorous it may look today, not only was it very expensive, but it was less safe. Plane crashes were far more common, and many people were still hesitant about getting on a plane. There was an industry of flight insurance that capitalized on this. Kiosks and vending machines that dispensed flight insurance were common at airports all over the United States and the wider world. Travelers could just purchase life insurance at the airport. You know, just in case the plane crashed. So Graham purchased life insurance on Daisy King, which was expected to pay out $37,500 equivalent to close to $400,000 today. The curious thing about this was that in order for the life insurance to actually be valid, the passenger flying was supposed to be the one to buy the insurance, or at least sign a declaration that the policy had been taken out in their name. Because Daisy never signed anything at the airport, the plan didn't really work. That life insurance was worthless. There was a brief moment at the airport where this plot could have been foiled. During the check-in, Daisy's luggage was significantly overweight, and she was required to pay an overweight fee, and it was here where she considered unloading some of the items from her bag. She was convinced not to and to pay the fee instead. Jack and his wife Gloria accompanied Daisy to the gate to say goodbye. That was where they bumped into another passenger of Flight 629, one Sally Schofield, a friend of Graham's wife, Gloria, who we mentioned at the beginning of this video. Jack and Gloria Graham left the airport. At just after 7 p.m., the bomb exploded in compartment number four, whilst the DC-6 was climbing. The plane disintegrated in the air. 44 people were now dead. Investigators obviously weren't able to connect Daisy King with the bombing right away. After an extensive look into the background of passengers on board the flight, those who knew Daisy encouraged investigators to look into Jack Graham where they discovered his previous encounters with the law. Further backing up suspicion in Graham was the aforementioned fragments of newspaper found amongst the wreckage. Daisy had taken evidence pointing towards her son in connection to her own death with her on the plane. Though he did initially deny involvement in the disaster, he did come clean and confess. Jack Gilbert Graham had no remorse for what he did. In fact, he went on record saying effectively that he didn't care that he not only murdered his mother, but also the lives of 43 innocent people. Going on further, saying that it would have made no difference to him if a thousand lives were lost. He simply did not care. He was convicted only of a single charge, that being the premeditated murder of his own mother. On January 11th, 1957, Jack Gilbert Graham was executed by gas chamber. In the United States, Flight 629 was only the second time an act like this was committed involving an airplane. The last time it happened was over 20 years previously. Airline bombings were sort of an unheard of thing at the time. Flight 629 would, unfortunately, not be the last time such events happened. Over the following years, a number of bombings occurred in the United States alone. Taking a step back and looking globally, airline bombings were on the rise. A critical shortcoming in airport and airline safety was exposed. This was a critical point in aviation history. Bombers were using planes as easy targets. 
And that's not even mentioning the instance of people bringing firearms onto planes. Numerous bombers were seeking those life insurance payouts, almost as if they were incentivized to commit such acts. Security just wasn't that stringent, and clearly something needed to be done about this. This was the 1950s, remember. There were no walk-through x-rays for passengers, let alone screening for cargo. The advancement of airport security around this time was slow. It wouldn't be until 1970 when the first x-rays and metal detectors began showing up at airports. Over the following years, measures such as physical passenger and baggage checks would become routine. Bombers, of course, would attempt to find ways around these checks. The bomb that brought down Pan Am Flight 103 was passed through multiple airports before it eventually found its way onto that plane, exploiting lack of security checks for connecting passenger bags through large international airports. A similar attack was performed on an Air India passenger plane in 1985. This will be getting its own video rather soon. Terrorists continue to get a bit creative. See the case of Philippine Airlines Flight 434. Notorious terrorist Ramzi Youssef concealed explosives in all sorts of ways. Inside his shoes, inside of household items, children's toys, all sorts. He was eventually caught, not before attempting to blow up a Boeing 747 passenger plane, but he is now behind bars. If you'd like to know more about that incident, consider watching our video on it. Airport security, as you likely know today, has now evolved even way beyond that. New technology that exists in airports all over the world can detect even the smallest of explosive materials. In 2015, an explosive device was planted on board a Russian passenger plane leaving Egypt. 224 people were killed that day. The Metrojet incident stands out among others in recent years as an outlier. Most bomb plots are foiled, and it's not a thing many people try anymore. But we'll also look into this disaster at a later date. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and be subscribed as there is always a new video every Saturday. And do let me know what you thought of this one, I know it was a little bit different. I would personally rank this one as a possible candidate for the best disaster breakdown video thus far. I was completely enamored with this story from the beginning, and there are more videos that I want to make that are kind of like this one. The next video that touches on this type of disaster will probably be Air India 185. Don't expect that for a while yet. Obviously, I don't want to cover a similar sort of incident twice in a row, so expect that to still take a little while because that will also be another big video as well. Anyway, a big thanks to my patrons over on Patreon for their amazing, ongoing, and generous support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, a massive thanks to you. Shout out this week to Alexi who increased their pledge just yesterday, in fact. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. If you yourself would like to support the channel further and even get your name featured at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that too will be linked in the pinned comment, and that is where I'll end things this week. I actually sometimes can't believe that Disaster Breakdown has been a consistent series for this long. So before I end, another thanks is in order for all of you continuing to watch and support my work. Thank you so much. Have a great Saturday, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.